Hi everyone. Welcome to Weekly Vet. Weekly Vet is our happy place to learn, share, discuss all things AI and AI technologies. And today we have a very special guest with us, Krishna Srinivasan. Weekly Vet is where students of Sudha come together to learn from speakers like Krishna and ask questions. And this is generally a starting point from where they take this learning for a lifelong process. And uh, today we are very happy to have Krishna here. Firstly, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Yashaswini Vishwanath and I'm logging from Bangalore and I would like to know where you're all logging from. We would like to get to know you. And uh, uh, Krishna is here. Uh, Krishna is a research software engineer at Google Research. His primary research interests include applications of machine learning to problems in natural language processing, information retrieval, multimodality. He has previously worked on information retrieval at Google Image Search, IBM, Apple, and Yahoo Search. Today, uh, Krishna will be talking about Wikipedia-based image text data set that they have created and published. It's a wonderful uh, point of time where we have been thinking about language AI. We have been thinking about global southern AI, where there are a lot of uh, languages and uh, how we have the NLP and the AI done for all the languages is something very important. And the data set that we have today has 108 languages. And we are open to learn from Krishna and understand more about this wonderful data set. Over to Krishna. Thanks very much for the very kind introduction, Yashashwini, and uh, very nice meeting you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Krishna Srinivasan, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the Wikipedia-based image text data set. I assume you can all see my uh, slides, and I will uh, page through them. And then if you have any questions at any point, feel free to uh, stop me, and then I'm happy to take take the questions and Yashashwini, feel free to moderate if you want to stop me at some point, ask somebody's question if it's, especially in the chat window or something, which I might not look at while doing the presentation. Uh, just a second. So very briefly, the agenda for the talk, uh, so I'll introduce about the data set, uh, give a context about the multimodal data sets as a whole, uh, prior to this, in between the introduction and multimodal, I'll maybe go over a few of the topics in artificial intelligence that pertains to this talk. Sudha also requested that I give a bit of an overview as a background context. And then I'll come to the main part of the talk, the WIT dataset itself. And um, just a second, uh, having some slide uh, issues here. Are you able to see my screen fine? Yes, yes, okay. we are able to see. The agenda screen, right? Full screen, full screen we are able to see. Excellent, Excellent. good. Uh, so now you're able to see the agenda screen. Yes, yes, perfect. And then I'll talk about some of the image text retrieval experiments after explaining the WIT data set. And then I'll conclude my talk with some future works and challenges that are out there, uh, building multimodal data sets and what we can do to solve to get a good global model. So first for the introduction, uh, briefly about me, I am presently in Google research. My areas of interest are natural language processing and information retrieval. And on the other hand, multimodality specifically using images and text, which are the two different modes that I am particularly uh, interested in my area of research. 
Uh, prior to this too, I have had information retrieval based experiences at various companies. And my hobby, I love reading books. And here are some links that you can connect with me if you want later. I'll probably make this deck shareable to later for everyone to look at these links in leisure. So uh, this work is not possible without my wonderful colleagues. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Karthik Raman, Jekau Chen, Michael Bendersky, and Mark New York, along with whom we published this paper to the SIG IR conference of last year, where it got accepted. And then as part of the paper, we also released this uh, data set. So the motivation for multimodal, multilingual data set. Uh, brevity is the soul of wit, said Shakespeare. But as long as it comes to this multi uh, machine learning models, uh, you want more data. The more data, the machine learning models learn better. And what you put in is what's going to come out. So you want high quality data sets. And if it's human edited, curated, verified, then it's even better. But large number of data sets are primarily in English. So you do want a global representation. You want it to be multilingual. And not just sort multilingual, the world is actually multimodal. We can uh, see each other, talk to each other, hear each other, audio, video, images, so on. So the more multimodal the knowledge, the way it's all connected and grounded to each other, the better for the models to learn. So that gives us like a very good reason for why we want multimodal, multilingual data sets. And in addition, you want this to be uh, as representative of the world knowledge base as it is, connecting all the entities, connecting various different phenomena and concepts across the world. So at this point, I will take a very quick detour uh, to neural networks and deep learning. And uh, pardon me if this is repeating what you might already know. At the same time, if you have any questions on this to dive deeper, uh, we can again uh, take it up in the Q&A session. So to start with uh, a good old linear regression that we all mostly learn in high school or in college, you have like a line fitting that takes a lot of points, adds weights and biases, and uh, it's going to make a linear prediction about something. So from there, uh, we come to neural networks. So even back in the 50s, uh, somebody hypothesized that, oh, why not we uh, look at how the brain neurons trigger on and off, connects to the other neurons. So why not we use something like this, where each node in this neural network will trigger on and off, connect to the next one. And then at the end of it, you can take all these predictions and come up with one sensible prediction that we want the model to make. We train it with data and we get some output. The deep in deep learning comes because the earlier models that we had were very simple. They had like one or two or three layers, but now uh, the number of nodes are many. It's in the billions or billions. The number of layers are many, and these are all connected to each other in very, very intricate ways. And uh, that is how we get deep learning. So what does deep learning do? Uh, any type of input that you give, just like how whatever you give to a computer ends up becoming a zero and a one, in the world of machine learning and neural networks, everything kind of ends up becoming an embedding. And an embedding is the representation of the data in a very huge multi-dimensional space. So here is a embedding of a particular word and it's represented by floating point numbers. And it's like this, think of it in 128, 256, 1024 dimensions that we cannot even conceptually easily imagine because we are used to three and at most four if we think of as like the time dimension or time travel, and this is 1024 dimensions. The machines are able to do all the mathematical operations in this high dimensions. And the very nice thing about it is, even though it's in a very large number of dimensions, the math rules, the addition, subtraction, distance finding, all those still apply very much. To illustrate that very quickly, I thought I'll share an analogy uh, with the world maps. The map is of course only a representation. It's a very abstract representation, uh, largely simplified of the real world, but still with this, we are able to learn so many things just by looking at it. Oh, which country is near which country? Do things separate these countries? Which country is surrounded by other things? Is this a big city or not? Because the big cities are generally called out in the map. And sometimes the capitals are highlighted and so on. Is, for example, if we take New Delhi, is Chennai close to New Delhi or is San Francisco close to Chennai? Which one is close? Just by looking at this and knowing about some properties of the world, uh, we are able to learn so many things. 
these exact kind of learnings apply to the world of embeddings too or two images close to each other look in the embedding map or two words related to each other you can learn from the embeddings are these words connected in a way do they form a sentence and all this kind of relations are the ones that is embeddings helps us make so with that i just want to kind of breeze through very quickly the various uh, various topics that are relevant to this multimodal data set i'm going to talk about uh, so with machine learning models there are uh, high level a few type of tasks one is regression where you want to predict one particular value then there is classification it could be binary classification given some inputs you want to say yes or no or it could be a multi class classification where you can pick and choose amongst the wide variety of classes then there is a third set of task called generation where you create something new compose a sentence compose an image compose music um so you have like this uh, general high level type of machine learning models that you can do and uh, now go to one level let's say text uh, based machine learning models so you can figure out sentiment you can classify the sentence you can um, figure out like is there are, there are entities in the sentence and so on and uh, over many many years um, the sentences are much more complex uh, structures a set of words not as simple as just looking at one word at a time so to understand the context we have this techniques uh, so recurrent neural networks and then later came the concept of attention in which the word does not exist by itself but it also learns from all the other words surrounding it so that's the attention uh, invention that kind of makes this possible building on top of attention is the transformers which is pretty popular these days it's a very great paper attention is all you need that kick started it and this is a way of putting together all these various neural networks with attention to be able to better understand language and then on top of transformers is we have uh, bert which is using the encoder part of the uh, attention transformer networks to be able to better learn language so this is like all the development on the language side and the models have been getting better and better and better with all these techniques and the data is increasing so we are able to have very good performance in the language based models on the other hand actually even prior to language it was the images that kick started this deep learning revolution um we have what are called cnns convoluted neural networks convolutional neural networks so these do an operation on images so if you notice in language it's text text becomes bytes bytes becomes ones and zeros images again are represented by ones and zeros so you use cnns to represent the images and then after that point it's another neural network which you can train to figure out do you want to classify the image do you want to identify the objects in the image do you want to write a caption for the image and so on that's been progressing and the images have been doing really very well those models and inspired by the images is how a lot of these techniques were also applied to text so now very interesting thing happened is that uh, constantly people had to train everything from scratch so literally boiling the ocean every time you want to train a small task so came two interesting concepts so one is pre training so where you have a unsupervised task where you kind of just give the lay of the land give it lot of images give it lot of text and then by that the model can use a task like oh let me try to fill in the missing word and then be able to learn more about the structure of the language and uh, similarly for images so this pre training model helps align all these various points knowledge points in the embedding space in a very close enough good enough way and from there we take and give it a particular task which is called fine tuning and you say oh i want to give only an image and i want you to tell me is there an object this particular object in it or there is an object tell me what the object is and that's called fine tuning so parallel to this is also this concept of knowledge transfer where you are learning with large generalized data and then you are able to take this and build a smaller model that might be faster that you want to use for online dynamic inference as opposed to doing it in a batch format and now put all this together we have uh, growth in language growth in images this techniques to better learn from both of them there is pre training that sets you up for success and then there is fine tuning that lets you do one specific thing for a given task and then there is knowledge transfer that people can use to learn from one model to the next model and 
on top of this because the world itself is very wide and multimodal and multilingual you want all this data to be put together to be able to learn better so that's like my very breezy introduction of the last fast paced 10 years of machine learning advances and research that happened and building on many many decades of prior knowledge as well so with that we'll uh, specifically get to multimodal data sets so to give a very uh, brief history of the multi world of multimodal data sets one of the earliest ones probably 8 9 years ago is this flickr 30k data set uh, flickr uh, photo sharing website from there 30000 images were sourced and five captions were written by human editors who looked at the images and came up with captions and these formed like a very great starting point here's an example a person is jumping doing a trick with a bicycle and they have some five captions and then uh, followed that by sbu captions by sb university so they came up with like lot more images crawl from the web but pulling out contextual information for the uh, image followed that up uh, we have like now on almost order of magnitude growth from flickr 30k to microsoft's common object and concept it's called the ms coco data set it's 330000 images with five captions each and this forms like one of the very big and important data sets and multimodal data sets and then uh, from one of our uh, sibling teams in google came conceptual captions so this goes an order of magnitude more than uh, the ms coco at 3.3 million images and captions so here the clever was the clever idea added was that if you were to just do the previous thing like ms coco did take 300000 and annotate by five human data for each image to write a caption this would be extremely time consuming it would be costly and it's a very uh, long time consuming as well as cost consuming process to do for 3.3 million images so the idea is that each image has an alt text which is used by the html and it's a it's a browser based tag and a lot of the times or some of the times people the website creators had an alt text for a particular image and the idea was to kind of use the alt text as the description for the image of course not all pages not all images have it and sometimes they are incomplete so this has to go through lots and lots of filtering processes to be able to uh, be used but that's what they did and then the authors released this conceptual caption status set so here is like a very brief uh, summary of all the various data sets that i have described so far uh, so on the one hand they are curated by humans and captioned by human editors on the other hand you can crawl from the web but you don't know what you're going to get and you use the alt text and you have to do lots of filtering and cleaning and even then there are some disadvantages that come with just crawling from the open web and the tasks keeps getting more complex and more interesting by the day so you have like started off with image text retrieval back when flickr was released and then it goes on to oh no we want to caption images we want to do visual question and answering we want to do visual entailment do this image and text go together common sense reasoning general q and a just keeps exploding into the number of tasks pretty much mimicking what all the things that we want to do in real life as well so here is a brief comparison as a table just the numbers based and one important thing that you'll notice for the most part all these data sets started off as english only and then later slowly uh, some of them got a i18n form like for example flickr exists in five languages ms coco in about four there is actually a smaller set of ms coco for 10 languages but that's only the test set not the full training set and so it's predominantly been an english based multimodal data set world to start with which brings us to our project wikipedia based image text data set so our uh, addition to all this wonderful ideas building on top is this question how do we combine the high quality high accuracy of human editing human curation with the scale of the web so flickr 30k ms coco asks humans to annotate conceptual captions crawls from the web but have to do a lot of filtering and our uh, idea was to hit wikipedia it's very big it's more than 50 million pages it's free in every sense of the word uh, and it com combines the two wikipedia is edited curated very heavily by humans so they make sure that the content is fresh the content is not stale 
and that it's available uh, for free for anybody to use. It's very high quality. There are millions of images there. And uh, to build on top of it, it is multimodal because each page is representing, uh, has got a lot of images that corresponds to the particular page. It is multilingual. There are hundreds of languages that are there in uh, Wikipedia. Granted that the distribution of the languages is not what we would like it to be, but still it's a start. Given that we started with nothing, uh, we have like at least access to dozens of languages. And they are all, uh, it's, it's a knowledge base to begin with. That's the purpose of Wikipedia. It's very entity rich and it's encyclopedic. So that's how we got started with this and then said, hey, why don't we do our model training based on this rich data set? And then uh, while doing the paper and other research, it occurred to us, oh, but this does not exist in the outside world. So maybe we should step one, build and release this data set so everybody can use it. And then in addition, we can continue our multimodal research along with this. So to explain, here is a, a example page, one of my favorite national parks, uh, Yosemite National Park, it's in California. And this is Half Dome, a peak in uh, Yosemite. So this is the standard Wikipedia page that you would see. But if you look at it, the page itself is very, very structured. Out of the Wikipedia pages, you can derive structure from them. There is a page title, there's a description, then there's an image and a caption underneath it. Then if you go to the actual image page, you are bound to get a lot more information as the right side of the slide uh, shows. Just like a short digression, I hiked up Half Dome long ago. That's me on top of Half Dome. It was pretty scary <laughs> to go to the edge for the photo. Uh, I crawled my way back immediately as soon as the photo was over. But the views are magnificent. It's a very humbling experience to do the hike. Um, sorry for the digression. Coming back, uh, Half Dome. Uh, so now from the page, we have gotten all the important information that we could need for a model. So you have the URL, the page title, the description, the caption, reference description that's underneath the image. Um, and then the page description, the section text, all this information that we have on the text side. And then on the image side, you have the actual image pixels themselves, metadata about the image, what it is called, what the size, the type of image, and so on. So here you have like this multimodality staring at you in the face. And you take them and put them together uh, to a particular nice machine readable format. Voila, you have a multimodal data set. So this is how the width data set looks with all the various column names, the field type, and the actual values. So here now we have like from uh, conceptual captions previous version to MS Coco, we have like an another order of magnitude jump for this large data set with 37 million plus pages with uh, 11.5 million unique images. And more importantly, 108 languages. Uh, we chose, there are more languages too. We chose the cutoff point uh, with a constraint that, okay, each language should have at least 10,000 image text rows. So it's big enough to be able to do a fine tuning task and then still set aside some data as a test set. Otherwise we could have gone for a few more hundred languages but then the size gets uh, smaller and smaller. To briefly give an idea, you can roughly say 50% of Wikipedia is in English. And then if you take the next four to five languages, that will constitute the next 40%. It's almost like a power law distribution. And then you take another five to 10 more languages, you are now at 98% or 99%. So the next 200, 300, 400 languages all constitute less than one or 2% of Wikipedia. So, um, so hence we had to make this decision of, okay, we'll release all the languages for which we have at least enough samples for a machine learning model to learn. So um, in addition to these raw numbers of number of rows and images and languages, uh, another interesting feature is because it's an encyclopedia, you have a lot of entities, there's 600,000 plus of them. And the other thing is the text and the images are represented in multiple languages. For example, Statue of Liberty could be in the English page, but Statue of Liberty being a global icon, it could be represented in Hindi, could be represented in French Wikipedia, could be represented in German Wikipedia and so on. And then there is all this interlinking between all these pages. They are all very, uh, very closely tied together. So the Statue of Liberty page will have a link to New York. New York will have a link to uh, some other museum there, 
and then that could then in turn link to the state or the country and so on. So it's all very intricately linked. Each link has a anchor text from which you can learn more about the link and the link graph. There is a knowledge panel that gives you some high level information, a lot of tabular data. So all these things are yet to be uh, truly tapped from this. So now put together in relation at the time of writing, we are like the largest publicly available uh, data sets. The last year and a half, there have been lots of other data sets that have come up, actually orders of magnitude bigger than even width. Uh, but a lot of them are available um, available either as, uh, oh, uh, like in the raw form. OK, here it is. The data is all the URLs. You go crawl it. Or in some other cases where the images are available, but um, there is some filtering process, but you do not guarantee it's like from the common web. You do not know what the full licensing terms are and um, it's the web. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, so at a very high level, um, so we start with the Wikipedia page and then we choose all the pages that have got an image with them, image and uh, because there are a lot of Wikipedia pages which are meta pages, which are information about some editing or it could be about many other things. So the normal Wikipedia that we see and read and like, those are the pages we had to filter. And then from there, we collect images and the captions and a lot of the surrounding information about the image as well as about the metadata of the page. So this is another very uh, unique thing about this data set is that, um, that normally all the image uh, text data sets, you will notice that there is an image in the caption. So here, uh, even by the name of caption, there are actually three captions. So one is on underneath the image, another could be the alt text, and the third could be on the image itself as a page for which there could be a lot of captions. So by default, it comes with like sometimes one or sometimes two or three, uh, three different types of captions. But in addition to that, I think one of the biggest uh, new additions is all the contextual information. So you have like, you know what page and topic this image and captions belong to. Which section does it belong to? The section title and the description, the page title and the description, and all these are again yet to be fully tapped. So you are giving a lot of information that you can potentially use to train the model saying, hey, this is just not an image and a caption. They exist in relation to this particular page. Or if you use the link graph in addition to all these other pages and topics and text that come along with it. So this enables you to build much more powerful models uh, on top of this. So starting with uh, 100 million plus pages, we come up with a lot of image text tuples, rows, and then we go through a very strict filtering process. Even though this is Wikipedia, we still need to do this filtering to make sure that the language, the license are all okay. And then of course the image and text themselves are indeed appropriate. Sometimes the text could be filler image. It will be somebody adding image 123.jpg, and that's not a useful caption. So we want to filter out those kind of um, things away from the data set. And then of course, uh, also using a uh, in-house classifier to make sure that the topics that we are filtering out are appropriate, because this is Wikipedia, so it could have about war, it could have about a discussion on any topic you can imagine, and not all might be very appropriate for a public data set that we want to train models on. Uh, so one another thing uh, do want to mention is that our data set will contain some of the biases that the original source itself contains. So like, for example, I mentioned that 50% uh, of Wikipedia is in English. So large part of our data set is likely to be in English too. Uh, Wikipedia might be uh, having a lot of bios on males than females. And hence this data set too would have. Or if we take like, for example, scientists or popular authors, again, there's like a very heavy bias towards certain countries, certain nationalities, and that tends to continue. Uh, the way we look at it is, so one, we are starting off with what is there, and rather than just throw all this away, it's like a way for us to identify and learn that these biases exist. So use the model for it, where it can provide value, but recognize that these biases are there. And how do we go about pointing this out to everyone and then improving the knowledge in all the other languages, in all the other countries and all the other cultures as a whole. 
so um that that i think is like very very important to uh, keep in mind so for example let's say uh, images are language agnostic medium right so maybe eiffel tower in could be there in let's say the english french and german page but maybe it's not in tamil and malayalam which is like my mother tongues uh but the eiffel tower page is still the same so there is nothing stopping somebody from taking this eiffel tower image and caption from the english or french page and putting it in the tamil page or some other thai or vietnamese or whatever page that needs it right so it makes you make all these connections across multi language multiple languages and raise the bar for knowledge available in all the languages and cultures so that was one of our uh, by far biggest motivations to do this in a very multilingual way rather than take english and the shortcut and release something quickly um so we did the, this is like again uh, another aspect of the data quality that we did we still wanted to make sure that the data that we were picking after all this filtering is still good so we take an image and a caption and we ask we sampled uh, about 4500 or so images and captions ask some raters uh, showing them a template like this do this images uh, and the caption go together is it helpful or not and resoundingly we got like over 95% of them on all the images and text said it's very useful it's just like a confirmation that one wikipedia the which we don't that much need wikipedia is good and two more importantly our filtering rules and the one that we have selected for the subset of the data is good uh, with that very briefly i'll talk about the image text experiments that we did the multimodal models this was our original inspiration this is where we started with doing and realized hey the models that we are training do not have much data just where we got to creating the data set so we started off as like a image text retrieval task so given an image and a text you want to find out give no so you train the model with both this information but the eventual task is you give it a image and you ask it to retrieve the captions that are there from uh, the model or you give it a caption and then you ask it to pick the correct images that best represent the caption so we trained on wit as the pre training data set uh, of creating this large model and then uh, we uh, also used conceptual captions as a baseline for comparing with another model and then we had like a test set that we set aside from wit itself as also uh, the test sets that were available in ms coco and flickr and some other languages were available we picked those languages and we also did the languages not based on the number of pages for example we tested on the hindi data set hindi if you uh, it's one of the top 5 languages in the world spoken by the number of uh, people but it ranks like 65th or something in the number of wikipedia pages available so if we just went by the wikipedia rank we would not choose important languages like this so instead we went even again like this is a way to kind of bring out the data disparity data size data set size disparity up front saying hey here is the popular languages as spoken by the world people of the world and this is where the metrics stand uh, because the usual thing is like for example if flickr is available in uh, english french and german everybody is going to be doing like a model trained on english french and german doing tests on that and then comparing with one another how oh, my model is better but then who is now ever going to bring up the other languages and show performance in them right so this is our way to kind of bring it up um i won't bore you with all the numbers of course when we uh, we did lots of lots of experiments to make sure that uh, the model could learn from an order of magnitude more data and we do very well on the test so one very interesting thing we found is the wit data set performs very well on the wit test set and the other data sets because it's not as representative of the world knowledge were not able to uh, perform as well on the wit test because normally like flicker or ms coco you take the general images it's like oh there's a dog playing in the beach and uh, uh, children playing with a ball something very general concepts whereas in wikipedia you will see something like president barack obama standing in front of white house or something completely uh, more complex and uh, more complex that's not represented in those type of general data sets um, so on that note i wanted to call out specifically the language model comparison table and um, the vocabulary comparison so again because this is a uh, very knowledge centric data set to begin with from wikipedia 
a large number of the words occur very few times so you could see the big disparity between even the next largest data set and wit so it represents a wide variety of concepts that the model can potentially learn from and that results in some of the disparity uh, or or differences that you see in the various uh, tests and experiments that we did uh, so with that a very quick uh, breeze through of the various links and data sets and our journey so we released the data in addition to submitting the paper at sigai or uh, we released the data set on github it links to the uh, places where you can download all the raw data uh, we uh, got fortunate to partner with some researchers from wikimedia foundation and together we put together a kaggle challenge and we also conducted a workshop at iclear uh, last year and um, and uh, with this competition we had like a lot of teams participating on this image text challenge they got state of the art score even much better than what we originally did using more complicated uh, better models and as part of this like all this data is available in kaggle and because it is wikipedia they were able to release the image pixels too so like large part of the data set is now available for download from the kaggle page as well as in the tensorflow data set so we made this available as well from the tensorflow side um so other than that there have been very lot of uh, interesting ideas coming out from researchers and teams across the world we were super happy to see the various ways which was used sometimes as a test set sometimes as like for analysis or uh, the third paper you will see actually analyzes misogyny pornography and malignant stereotypes so these were all the things that they were looking at for various multimodal data sets and uh, happy to report they cited wit as a good example which does very thorough filtering and made sure that this was not perpetrated uh, perpetuates representing if you generally crawl the web what are the dangers that could occur if you are not careful with all the steps um so also happy to share again like uh, wikimedia uh, recognized our work with a research award of the year so we're very honored by it and again we attribute it again to the community of Uh, wikipedia that creates all this knowledge and we were just instruments in putting all this together and making it available for everyone so um beyond that all the various links in one page um so another thing that i just not have time to go deep thought as put us like a leading point if you have questions on this is uh, we went through a lot of experience in one creating a data set uh, conducting a competition and then connecting it in kaggle and then of course coordinating a workshop these are all as many people here can uh, tell um many people can tell or uh, very challenging tasks by themselves so uh, just thought put it as a slide we'll open up to questions uh, future work and challenges so as i uh, mentioned um i'll go through this fairly quickly because i want to give enough time for all the questions and answers uh, so the wikipedia data is rich there is lot of cross lingual captions same caption in multiple languages for the same image across multiple language pages and so on so we thought that could be really useful and then of course using it for other things more complex tasks like question answering common sense reasoning using the entities and also eventually even go to other modalities the video audio and so on or whole page understand so quick demo of mozart's page and you can see captions in various different languages uh, some captions might not be a genuine translation of whatever came first the original and you would see some of them are really small some of them could be more detailed and so on but uh, overall the data at least exists in so many things for us to be able to study more and analyze and learn more from it uh, to give a quick sample i put together from uh, existing data sets and papers of all the various interesting tasks like uh, the retrieval one is the one that i primarily mentioned but in addition there is what's called the referring this expression you can like choose a part of an image and then say what is that about and you see the more interesting thing about the question answering so you have to look at the image to learn things and then you look at the text to understand the question put the two together to be able to answer and then there are even more complex ones like reasoning so uh, the last images show something about uh, reasoning or how many children are in the bed two or one so uh, to be able to answer again you understand the question you understand the language understand the picture figure out a question is being asked and come up with the correct answer putting all these things together so really really very interesting world again like a wide variety of tasks 
that we all do it very naturally in the real world. And we would ideally want to train the models to be more powerful, to be able to reason, to be able to be more accurate in reasoning all these things. That could be done. Uh, so that uh, concludes my official uh, slides and talk that I put with. Thank you so much again, Global South and Weekly Wednesday, and all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about our uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Krishna, for coming over and giving this talk here. Uh, now we would like to uh, go over the chat contents and uh, uh, address them. So firstly, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Susanna has said that I, I will read out the comment. At Women in AI Ethics, there is an active Wikipedia group working to make sure that women are included. The reason why they were not included, Wikipedia requires two or three third party publications to be able to uh, take them as a writer. That is two or three independent organization or parties must write about you. You might think this is a wonderful criteria, but most women either are never written about or as society functions, women are not appreciated publicly for their work. So societal and historical biases keep women out of Wikipedia because of this rule. Women in AI ethics is fighting a battle with Wikipedia editors who are also men from Western countries deleting entries. So using Wikipedia solely is perpetuating this bias. Um, so there are two points that I want to mention, uh, really great points and they definitely exist. And that's one of the reasons I uh, also talked about that this exists. So you do not generally want to use only one data set alone. So you use many data sets, which you think represents uh, the correct distribution of what we want. Uh, and you also use it not for doing things that you know would have this particular bias, uh, not, not use it for that particular task, but more as for generally learning knowledge about the world, generally for the model to get uh, more information. Uh, this is a very, uh, this actually becomes even more so the case when you go out to the full web of data. So we kind of think of this as like a way to identify the problem, use it for what it is good at, but at the same time, keep, keep thinking about the ethics bias and all the very important questions we have to ask and, and not, not use this as like anything um, that, that does not address the actual distribution of the real world, right? So that is probably um, the way I would look at it. The other way is uh, to use this as like a way to kind of motivate and bring up the issue. Hey, Wikipedia that says it's for knowledge uh, sharing with everybody has this much biases. Think about the other things where it could be biased to start with or not even ask all these questions and how worse could that be to bring these issues to the top it's like another way I would think about um, using these things. Thank you, Krishna. Um, Susanna, is there uh, something that you would like to tell? <laughs> no, nothing at all. Thank you, Krishna. Thanks for the answer. The thing is that uh, it's not a real distribution of the world that Wikipedia is representing. And we have to be aware of that. Every data set that is out there is actually representing a distribution of the world that is seen prior to women's rights were you know, given. So it's, uh, it's important to address that whatever data set, no matter how many you use, this bias will always be there because this bias has not been removed from the world itself. So how will you counter this bias in any data set is my question to you. Oh, well, uh, that is a much, much larger, uh... <laughs> larger topic than the, that that itself could be like a whole hour day or week of discussion of how to do so i think the starting point is just acknowledging like what your data set is built from right so in our paper we had like an appendix where we show how we started off with the various pages what we used what filtering criteria we used 
and how we built this. Uh, mm-hmm. Recently, there are like co- concepts called model card, data card that people uh, release along with the data set saying, hey, this is what the distribution is. So in our appendix, we have uh, information about, oh, this is how many entities are there, or this is how many uh, languages are there in the data set. And for each language, how much, how many image text uh, examples are there that could be used. So just putting this out, think of this as like the equivalent of the nutritional labels you have and you provide something and then you start with that and then see uh, how best it could be used for your particular uh, use case. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Krishna, we have uh, one more question from Suresh. Suresh is asking, please clarify how you're coming up with the query words to run the test. Oh, uh, the queries are actually the captions themselves. So when we say queries in this case, it is the caption. So if it's like uh, children playing in the beach, then that becomes your uh, text query. And then you give that caption for the test and then you find out all the relevant images and vice versa for the image to text task where you give an image of maybe children playing in the beach and then you ask the model to retrieve all the sentences and rank them in the order that it's most appropriate and represents the uh, image yeah so krishna do you, do you uh, so uh, do you send the same query to different uh, data set models and then see what it retrieves is that what you're doing uh, great point so each data set will have its own small test set so what we do is we uh, test only on the model that has been trained and when you use this test set, it is supposed to pick only from the test set, right? Like, so let's say there's a width test set. Right. Uh, you pick, let's say there's uh, 10,000 rows and you pick one image and then you give it to the model as an input and then say, here's the embedding. Now pick from these 10,000 equivalent, let us say it's a one-to-one image to text. Uh, the text is what we call the query. So from these 10,000 uh, sentences or queries, pick the query that most represents this image. So it's, you just do this in a very contained test set fashion one at a time. This would be like a bigram, unigram, and trigram and things like that, right? You would say a boy or a you know boy in a beach or something like that, correct? Uh, normally, yes. So the, the traditional information retrieval world, we, you and I come from, yeah. that's like one yeah. of the search engine uh, techniques. So you have unigrams, bigrams, and you try to put them, and then you do this uh, TFIDF type of, or BM25, type of retrieval and ranking to come up with the results. But right. here, uh, as I showed very quickly in the architecture diagram, what ends up happening is you use what is called a two tower model. You have an image tower which creates an embedding for the image and there's a text tower which creates an embedding for the text. So now you just have two points in this high dimensional space and you calculate the cosine similarity between them to figure out that they are as close to each other as possible. And then you pick that as your uh, top result. I think you also cross verify with other uh, data set models. Uh, is my understanding right or uh, no? Correct. So, it- so we test all the t- test sets on any one particular model. So let's say model A is oh. trained on WIT. Uh, so it will be tested with the WIT test set, COCO test set, uh, conceptual right. captions is set and then flicker and so on. Then there's a model trained model B, which could be trained on conceptual captions and then tested on all the other things and so on. So, yeah. Got it, got it. And also I think you shared a very great idea uh, for Susanna's uh, thought uh, where, you know, uh, to go and scan all the images to partition by, uh, you know, uh, uh, classification of a male versus a female. And then maybe we can come up with some distribution of, if it's not already done, right? We could come up with some distribution of, you know, the bias that could likely exist, I think. That's that's a fantastic point. And, uh, and Wikipedia makes it uh, more straightforward and easy because they already have classified it. Like, let's say, for example, it is all various scientists or actors and actresses, right? It already has like the biography kind of saying, hey, they are from this country or they are from this continent. And then again, of course, uh, male versus female or uh, any other uh, sex is itself already available. So to be able to just take it from... Uh, 
not not even looking at as a image text data set just looking at as like a wikipedia as a whole uh, all this Uh, various different types of looking at the data some of them have been done there are some analysis that people do and then i think wikipedia itself has like a yearly um, i won't say audit but they have like this uh, periodic process where they come up with various distributions on uh, various angles but of course they will not by themselves be able to think of every single thing so if there is something that's of interest to us the nice thing is all of wikipedia data is public like including the edit history including how it uh, with the various different versions uh, all that information is like downloadable and parsable uh, but but we need so it's it's like in this case asking the right questions becomes the more important thing then then it becomes like a very quick programmatic task to find the answers but asking the right questions is where it starts got it got it and uh, is this uh, uh, somehow uh, this uh, data could improve the uh, searches as well right search or, i think google has a search for images also right so maybe the yep. learning this could also infuse uh, improvements in that particular uh, categories i think great point yes so google has a very big image search uh, team i used to be part of that before i moved to research and so image search does use all this images uh, it's like again wikipedia just like as it's with the rest of the web that google crawls and indexes and then uh, gives them by relevance uh, ranking when somebody types in uh, any particular query um the the reason this is uh, you still want to separate is to be able to enable any researcher in the world to be able to build a type of information retrieval system or a model or something and then be able to use this data set to one train or more importantly test their model saying hey how well does it do for this wikipedia data so that's like kind of the questions that you can get from this got it uh thank you sirish yeah, you you, you have any more questions to us you can ask no i'm good i'm i'm good thank you <clears throat> uh so thank you krishna for joining us here and giving us this talk for the last one hour you have given us so many new words and i i think we will have a, a good time learning more about each of these and using the data set that you have mentioned maybe we can do some research ourselves or uh, how we can use the data set in our languages here uh, as uh, we have uh, the global south and ai and uh, how we can use like how is it for the mother tongues our mother tongues and uh, try to do some research around it and thanks a lot from weekly vet thanks a lot from business school of ai and global south and ai for coming here and giving us all this information thank you thank you so much great to uh, hear that it was uh, useful and good luck in all the various missions and if you have any questions feel free to reach out to us more than happy to answer or help in whatever way we can glad it was useful thank you so much for giving me the opportunity namaste thank you thank you krishna thank you krishna thank you everybody for joining us please join next weekly vet at the same time 9 am pacific time thank you i'll catch you next weekly vet bye